morning and uh, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to uh, this Kennan Institute live event on uh, the New START Treaty and the future of US-Russia arms control. I'm Matt Rojansky. I'm the director of the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center. And I wanna thank everybody for being with us. Uh, in particular, our two outstanding panelists. I, I can't think of two uh, better friends and colleagues with whom to have this discussion on this important and increasingly, uh, I at least believe, urgent topic. Um, the New START uh, Strategic Arms uh, Reduction Treaty is the last uh, strategic nuclear arms control agreement that's still in force between the United States and Russia. And as uh, almost all of you probably have heard, uh, it is set to expire in less than four months unless it is extended. Uh, negotiations towards a possible extended extension are now underway. Uh, but of course, there are widely varying reports and perspectives, shall we say, on the state of those negotiations, what it would mean if an agreement is reached, uh, and as well as what comes next. So I think we're going to be able to talk about all of that uh, in much more detail with our, our two wonderful speakers. Uh, before we start, I want to remind you, you can stay up to date with this topic and many others uh, by following our podcasts, Kenan X, uh, that's just one word, Kenan with the letter X, and our newest podcast, The Russia File. Um, they are both available on um, the iTunes uh, podcast store and everywhere else you can listen to podcasts. You can also get our latest written analysis on the Russia file and Focus Ukraine blogs. Uh, I want to now introduce our two speakers, uh, and, and then I'll let them each just go ahead and open with their remarks. Uh, and I'll be taking questions all the way through uh, by email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org via Twitter at Kennan Institute, all one word, or on our Facebook page. And please, if you include your name and affiliation with your question, it makes it more likely that it will get through uh, our outstanding staff filter and come up before my eyes on the screen and I will ask it for you. Um, so I'm gonna begin uh, by introducing Lynn Rustin, who is the Vice President for Global Nuclear Policy at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Uh, before she went to NTI in 2017, she held positions in the US government, including Senior Director for Arms Control and Nonproliferation on the National Security Council, uh, Chief of Staff for the Department of State's Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation, and has also served previously as a Senior Advisor in the Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance, where she led the interagency backstopping process to support negotiation and ratification of New START. Uh, her MS is in National Security Strategy from the National War College, an MA in Russian and East European Studies from the University of Michigan, and a BA in Government with High Honors from Oberlin College. Uh, Fyodor Wojtylovsky has, since 2017, served as Director of the Institute of World Economy and International Relations of the Russian Academy of Sciences, also known as MMO. Um, he worked at MMO since 2003 and has previously served as Deputy Director for International Politics. His master's is from the Department of History uh, of Moscow State Lomonosov University, where he also completed his PhD in political science and international relations uh, at MMO and serves as a full professor. Uh, Fyodor has been uh, elected a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, quite a, a prestigious accomplishment, uh, I should add, and his research interests are wide ranging uh, from US foreign and security policy in Europe and the Asia Pacific to Russia US relations and US China relations. Uh, he's also been a participant, if I may note with me, in a number of second track uh, bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral uh, international security and diplomacy initiatives. Uh, and I would say is always an insightful and productive voice in the conversation. But we're going to begin now with Lynn, uh, and then we'll go directly to Fyodor. And don't hesitate to send in your questions as they are speaking. Please, Lynn. Thanks um, very much, Matt, for the introduction and for having me here today. And I'm pleased to be sharing the screen with Fyodor. Um, and Matt, I commend you for uh, managing to schedule this just the Monday after a bout of Twitter diplomacy on New Start that occurred uh, on Friday. But before we get to that, I'd like to step back and sketch out we, where we are in terms of the bigger picture. Um, of course, right now here in the United States, we're consumed with the pandemic and uh, the election but in the background, there's a larger world with a host of security challenges and a couple of opportunities, uh, none of which are really getting much focus right now. And that lack of focus in and of itself is concerning. Um, a nuclear incident seems to the public and our leaders 
Um, as remote today as a global pandemic probably seemed a year ago to most of us. But just as we need to prepare for and prevent the next pandemic, we can't afford to be plant complacent when it comes to preventing nuclear risks. Um, I don't need to tell this audience, especially uh, about how low relations between Russia and the West have sunk. Uh, and I'd say the actions and the grievances on both sides that are kind of cementing this rupture are deepening. So I worry a lot that we haven't hit bottom yet in our relations. Nonetheless, um, or maybe even therefore, because of that, it's really critical that our countries get back on the path of crisis avoidance and strategic stability. We did it during the Cold War and we need to do it now. So what do we do first? I would argue that first the United States and NATO and Russia need to talk more. We really need to get away from um, kind of, we need to decriminalize diplomacy, I would say, and stop treating it like it's a reward for good behavior. Um, you know, we need to, we need more talking and more engagement in mill to mill channels, and we need to search for actionable steps with Russia to improve the current situation. Um, turning to the subject of our, you know, seminar today, uh, arms control, it's the bottom line up front for me is that the United States and Russia absolutely should be extending new start without conditions. Um, and then with that foundation in place, we should continue the discussion of next steps. And I, I hope that I don't uh, need to spend a, a lot of time um, right now on, on why I think New START serves our national security, but briefly, it serves US security because it's in our benefit to have legally binding limits and verification on Russian strategic nuclear forces. This has basically been US policy for the last 50 years and it's still true today. I don't view the treaty as um, a favor to Russia and I don't view extending it as, uh, as a concession, nor do I think it's particularly good leverage. Um, I don't think Russia benefits more from START than we do, we both benefit. So at this point, as you said, Matt, we're three and a half months before its expiration. There really isn't time to do much besides extending the new START treaty and then keeping negotiating on what comes next. And I'll just add that um, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that Russia has um, already dropped preconditions. It was talking about a couple of years ago in terms of new START extension. It's confirmed that the Sarmat ICBM and the avant-garde hyper hypersonic vehicle will be counted under the treaty. Those are really important clarifications. Um, and so, and now, of course, just on Friday, President Putin has indicated a willingness to um, extend the treaty for a shorter period of time, like a year. Um, personally, I'd rather see us extend it for the entire five years, but I think any extension is far preferable to uh, letting it lapse. So I can leave, I'll leave the state of play on this to q and if people wanna talk about it more, um, other than to say, I think losing this treaty would just be a dangerous unforced error. But that was supposed to be the easy part, extending New START. The hard part is, you know, what we do next in our strategic nuclear relationship with Russia. Um, I assume this audience is well acquainted with kind of the laund laundry list of issues that um, either the US or Russia or outside experts have suggested need to be addressed. And, you know, the list is Russia's novel strategic systems under development hypersonic and prompt strike systems on both sides, non-strategic nuclear weapons, now INF range delivery systems, um, missile defense space, cyber nuclear conventional, and of course, bringing in China and the other P5 nuclear states. It is simply impossible, of course, to tackle all of these issues in the same time frame. Um, the most likely paths forward in my view is to establish forums where these issues can be discussed and seek to make progress on at least some of them where possible. And throwing out some examples, I mean, the next strategic arms control agreement should be expanded to include Russia's novel systems, strategic range, um, prompt strike and hypersonic systems, more accurate counting rules for bomber weapons, just as an example. 
And of course, to get there on further reductions, we're going to have to discuss and address in some fashion Russian concerns uh, on prompt conventional strike capability and also missile defense. But I'd say if assuming New START remains in place, then even more important than the next strategic treaty is doing something to address the deteriorating security situation in Europe. This is where the risk of conflict through accident or miscalculation is most likely. We've got proximity of our forces, short warning times, entanglement of nuclear and conventional capabilities. This all compounds the risk. So we need, as I said before, to reinvigorate crisis management mechanisms and agree on rules of the road and other measures to reduce dangerous military incidents between NATO and Russian conventional forces in and around Europe. We need to prevent an arms race in INF, INF range missiles in Europe with the Russian deployment of an INM 7-2M missile and the demise of the INF treaty. We need to reestablish uh, restraint in that class of weapons. And we need to reduce risk from non-strategic nuclear weapons. It's been a longstanding goal of the United States and a concern in the US Congress uh, about Russian non-strategic nuclear weapons. But I would say more broadly, in addition, this class of weapons, whoever owns them, raises concerns of early use, command and control, and physical security. And so I would say that working with NATO, the United States should develop a negotiating strategy for mutual steps we could take with Russia to reduce the risks posed by this class of weapons. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time on space and cyber risks. That's gonna be more, um, they're difficult issues and more prone to things like norms and rule of the roads to try to help um, clarify intentions and reduce risks. They're not really uh, as, as uh, suited for formal treaties and much of this isn't. On China, I think we need to you know, walk before we run. We need to um, have increased um, crisis management mechanisms First steps like agreeing on a ballistic missile test launch notification regime like we have with Russia and like China has with Russia, but we don't have with each other would be a good first step. Nu nuclear risk reduction uh, centers between us and China would be good. Um, and my sense in is in terms of we have a lot of homework to do internally and work with our allies in Asia before we would get to the point of advancing arms control um, proposals with China. And then just finally, uh, the P5 process should be reinvigorated and we need to take steps to uh, reaffirm our commitment to the, to the MPT and our Article 6 obligations on disarmament. Um, so I'll just, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to hearing from Fyodor and joining the discussion. Great, thanks Great. very thanks. much, Lynn. Uh, Fyodor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew, and thank you, Lean. Um, it's an honor to be here today, and I'm very grateful for Wilson Center for this opportunity. Uh, uh, what is very interesting, when experts uh, focused on arms control and international security on both sides are talking to each other, they're speaking the same language. Uh, which differs us from uh, from politicians and decision makers sometimes. Uh, I think I would like to support many what Lean has said today, and I think that uh, current start tree should be extended for next five years, and it's the only uh, real step which can give us uh, background and timing for preparing for. Uh, changes in the strategic and security environment of uh, the emerging world order. And I'm uh, sure that uh, what we have um, developed, I mean, Soviet Union and the United States and then Russia and the United States uh, in, during this, uh, you know, long lasting negotiations and uh, going from one treaty to another, we have developed the unique strategic culture of dialogue, we have created the unique strategic culture of trust and confidence-building measures, 
And uh, of course, uh, you know, arms control mechanisms were never preventing, you know, technical uh, development of uh, and technological development of uh, strategic nuclear weapons or other systems. But anyway, uh, uh, this dialogue has produced a very, very um, significant uh, legacy. And uh, taking um, uh, start, current START treaty, we need to be focused and thinking about the future, we need to be focused on three very significant results of arms control process in general, uh, uh, which uh, is very good represented by current START treaty. First, limitation in numbers of delivery devices and uh, warheads. Second, verification mechanism and uh, confidence building measures, including information exchange and uh, uh, technical inspections. Uh, third, uh, which is very significant, uh, open architecture for uh, developing uh, technologies for changes in the uh, strategic capabilities of each other and readiness to integrate uh, new systems uh, according to um, uh, the prescriptions of uh, the current treaty or uh, preparing uh, next treaty with uh, including um, new technological uh, changes, uh, the role of uh, new systems, not only strategic uh, offensive, uh, but also uh, other systems which are influencing on strategic stability. What we are seeing now, to my mind, of course, uh, uh, we, we see the very high politicization of dialogue on issues which are much more uh, security than political, but of course uh, significant for international relations. But uh, this politicization has emerged from domestic politics, especially in the United States. And uh, I think uh, it's dramatically influencing on the environment of dialogue between uh, diplomats and uh, military professionals uh, or on both sides. And I think it's very dangerous uh, because, um, you know, uh, in the United States, uh, we see uh, that uh, uh, current administration uh, is, um, you know, trying to change uh, the treaty, which they call uh, uh, the not, not the best treaty, or uh, of course it has been pre prepared for the previous, uh, by the previous administration, but they are trying to uh, uh, in uh, integrate into um, uh, the treaty during the um, uh, procedure of, uh, um, uh, of uh, <clears throat> extension uh, some new elements which are, are not, uh, you know, really uh, interconnected with the main agenda of uh, um, uh, arms control in the sphere of strategic offensive system. Um, also, uh, in Russia, uh, you know, this uh, very complicated dialogue uh, has influenced uh, on uh, uh, some minds in expert community, and we have what we have seen, especially uh, during the last year. Uh, the appearance of some uh, so-called uh, thinkers who are trying to bring into the pub public uh, narrative some ideas about uh, uh, the new logic of arms control without treaties. And uh, these people are dangerously uh, talking about uh, some other uh, measures which can be used uh, uh, when we will have no treaties at all. Uh, and when uh, the uh, whole mechanism of arms control will uh, disappear. Uh, of course, it's very dangerous philosophy and I, uh, I'm sure that it is not uh, supported by uh, Russian uh, diplomatic and military officials who know very well uh, the stakes uh, of uh, such, you know, um, uh, uh, aventuristic uh, approach to uh, the sphere of arms control and strategic stability. But anyway, we see that lots of factors has emerged which are changing the understanding of strategic stability. 
And uh, I think that the uh, eclipse of the logic of strategic stability, which has been uh, based for decades on the logic of mass destruction, uh, or mutual assured destruction, or I'm sorry, or mutual assured, uh, assured destruction, uh, is also influencing on minds. And uh, of course, there are a lot of new technological uh, factors uh, such as um, uh, non-nuclear conventional strategic offensive systems, uh, such as uh, changes in uh, the development of missile defense systems and missile, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, some new uh, technological developments in the sphere of high precision uh, conventional weapons and uh, uh, hypersonic uh, systems which are influencing on uh, the whole strategic stability. But we have to think when we will, we will be thinking about next steps uh, in, in arms control, we need to take into account these factors and also other factors which Lean uh, has mentioned, including cyber issues, space security, um, and, uh, and uh, tactical, possibly uh, in the future, tactical nuclear weapons. But uh, right now, and it is very significant, uh, ground-based intermediate and short range uh, missiles. Uh, because uh, of course, they, they are not belonging to strategic class of uh, uh, nuclear forces, but they are influencing on the whole security environment. Uh, they are changing and uh, uh, they are becoming more and more, they're developing, they're becoming destabilizing factors, factors for um, uh, the uh, strategic stability in the sphere of strategic nuclear systems. And uh, um, they, are, they are destroying the, the, the basic principles uh, of uh, strategic stability, which, is, uh, which are much more psychological and military than political. And uh, uh, the, the basic one is uh, that both sides are, uh, do not have, uh, are not having motivation for preliminary uh, nuclear strike against each other because they know that uh, the reciprocal uh, affect uh, can, uh, can uh, bring them uh, the um, uh, unprecedented and unacceptable uh, damage. So um, I think that if we will uh, extend the current uh, START treaty for five years, and I still have hope that all dances uh, will uh, uh, that we will have that we are having around uh, this extension will uh, uh, will bring us to the final uh, point uh, of this dialogue and uh, uh, dances will, will will not be dances just for dancing uh, and we will we, we'll have some uh, positive result and uh, I think that um, we. During these five years, which we will have after the extension of START Treaty, of current START Treaty, uh, we can find uh, some uh, answers to the questions which uh, um, are, uh, which we are having in different spheres um, uh, surrounding uh, strategic stability and arms control. And uh, we will also have time to think what is going on with Chinese a strategic nuclear program, how it is developing. Uh, uh, we know that uh, right now China is not interested in any participation in any uh, uh, legal and political arms control mechanisms. Uh, they only have an official level, they have uh, no first use principle. Uh, uh, so uh, hypothetically, it's a, a high uh, nuclear threshold. Uh, but nothing else on the uh, declared uh, political level. And our Chinese partners, uh, only on expert community level, they are, uh, uh, they are mentioning the figure of 1,000 uh, warheads, which they uh, could reach someday and which, uh, could, uh, uh, and which would uh, uh, give them uh, you know, the equal voice in the dialogue uh, uh, with uh, Russia and the United States in terms of numbers uh, of uh, warheads and, uh, and uh, um, uh, delivery uh, devices. So uh, I agree that uh, if we will 
uh, be thinking about including China, we need to uh, also to include France and Britain into this uh, puzzle. And uh, but it will be absolutely new architecture of uh, arms control, which will be very different from bilateral uh, mechanisms we used to have for decades. So I'll stop here and I will be ready to continue with answers. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, I, we have questions coming in from the audience and, and let me remind uh, those who still want to ask a question. You email Kenan at wilsoncenter.org. You can tweet at Kenan Institute or post the question on our Facebook page. And again, please include your name and your affiliation if you have one. Um, but I, I do want to start with uh, a question of my own. And actually, it's one that uh, arose as I listened to both of you um, and with slightly different accents, uh, no pun intended. Uh, there was a central thesis here uh, that I feel like has become relevant again, maybe 40 years after it first was uh, central to arms control, and that is psychology. I think in a, in a sense, uh, from perhaps the 1980s onward, uh, once arms control kind of uh, went through a few hiccups, and certainly in the post-Cold War period, we've had some basic assumptions about you know, why you do arms control, why this type of approach to strategic stability, the, the term of art, or just you know, maybe call it uh, peace, even despite inter serious international disagreements. But why this, this, this highly regimented approach of arms control is necessary. And I guess what I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, Fyodor, you said that the principles of, of arms control are more kind of psychological and political than they are military. You talked about the culture of dialogue and trust, um, the logic of mutually assured destruction versus today's sort of politicized environment. Um, you know, Lynn, you talked about the risk factors in Europe. Uh, it seems to me there we have a, a, a radical clash of worldviews about you know what should be uh, the outcomes, what should be the shape of the world order. Um, so the question I want to ask each of you to consider uh, is essentially whether each side, uh, both on the level of leadership and on the level of society more broadly, is psychologically and politically ready to do arms control, and if not. What would it take to get there? Who wants to, maybe Lynn, would you, would you go first on that? Um, sure. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question in terms of, maybe I'll actually start with the public and then turn back to leadership. Um, you know, on the one hand, the public, this is not as proximate of fear or concern in the minds of the public, I mean, maybe not me, but my, old, my older sister literally was still in school when they were doing duck and cover drills, you know, and, um, you know, worrying about a, a, a strike from the Soviet Union. I mean, I, I cut my teeth at the Congressional Research Service doing issue briefs on the nuclear freeze movement in the early 1980s when, you know, people, Americans were worried about nuclear war with the Soviet Union. They were worried about the deployment of mobile missiles in the United States roaming around the country on on uh, trucks or trains. Anyway, um, people don't, you know, the public is not as seized with this issue now, um, which means that they don't put pressure on their leaders. Um, leaders, I mean, I still think there's a pretty strong consensus um, in, in favor of, you know, seeing how the United States gains, how the military, you know, benefits from having a regulated um, relationship with Russia when it comes to strategic nuclear weapons. I mean, it is a, it is a class of weapons where, you know, it's kind of a, it's a, a myth to think you can have significant advantage at some point when you've both got thousands of them and, you know, a few weapons would do, you know, unbelievable destructions to societies, populations, economies. Um, and so, you know, why wouldn't you rather do what we've been doing since 1972, which is negotiating agreements that, you know, limit numbers, provide verification that the other side is um, complying with the agreement that provides, you know, predict, a, you know, a stable planning environment for our military um, so that they know what to, what their, what the threat is going to look like in, in years out 
and frankly, so that we can spend military dollars on capabilities that are more, you know, are the ones we actually use in the world, which are, you know, a range of conventional and other technologies. So um, it makes a lot of sense. And I still think there's a lot of support um, for it bipartisan you know, amongst our leadership. Um, and even now, I mean, the, um, you know, this admitted, the current administration is pursuing agreements. It's, um, so it, it, it's not saying, as I understand it, that we shouldn't have agreements. They um, assess New START differently than I do in terms of its value. Um, and they have a, maybe a different approach to the next negotiation than I would take in terms of prospects for success. But, you know, even the current administration seems to see, see value in, you know, regulating um, our bilateral relationship and recognizing that there's developments that Russia is taking militarily and in the nuclear sphere that we would prefer, prefer to address, you know, through some kind of constraints. But obviously, if you're going to impose constraints on one country, you're going to need to accept some on yourselves to get agreement. Um, thanks, Lynn. Fyodor, uh, oh, okay. you- Can I throw in one yeah. other thing about the public? I, I'm sorry, I meant to say this. Even though it's not proximate in people's mind, um, we've done polling um, at NTI, it's on our website, which actually shows that when you ask the American people on a bipartisan basis, do you think we should have nuclear arms control agreements with Russia? You know, should we have dialogue with Russia to reduce nuclear threats? If there's actually really strong bipartisan um, support for that. So I don't think it's, uh, my only point in saying that is, even though it's not something that's on top of mind for the public, it's not politically risky for leaders to do. I'll stop there. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so Fyodor, you spoke uh, in your opening uh, quite a bit about the, the preferences uh, and the approaches of, of Russian officials, the uniform military and the political leadership. But I'm really curious about this, this question of the public um, because it, as Lynn correctly pointed out, there has been such a, a slide away from acute awareness of this problem. Um, and also because, you know, to the extent that I consume Russian media uh, for the general public, what I often see is a tone of much uh, more um, kind of alarmism about how dysfunctional and scary uh, the American system has become, that it's so unpredictable, that it can do such dangerous things. Um, are Russians more aware of the problem and the need for arms control, the Russian public? Is it, is it ready? Is it calling out for treaties or do they not care? Uh, I think that a uh, very interesting question, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, on a public level, people are not so concerned uh, with arms control issues, but they are concerned, concerned with the state of, of the Russian-American relations, especially people uh, who remember uh, Soviet-American relations and uh, they uh, last phase and uh, the beginning of uh, relations between Russia and the United States. On the one hand, there is a big disappointment uh, in expectations that uh, Russian society had about um, the new relationship with the West and especially with the United States. But on the other hand, um, it, it also has uh, some elements of, uh, uh, you know, very, uh, very not uh, politicized attitude towards American people. And it's another issue, but it also influences on uh, some uh, public attitude towards any uh, political and uh, steps and any decision making in such spheres as uh, Russian American relations and arms control. Uh, so in case uh, we will have the extension of the treaty, uh, for the next five years, it will be supported by uh, public, and I'm sure it will have face no, uh, you know, um, no uh, hardships uh, uh, on the parliamentary level because we have to uh, ratify extension. It's different uh, um, from uh, American system where you need to ratify only the new treaty. But I think that uh, it will go through the parliament easily, uh, and I think that. Um, uh, a lot of changed in psychologies of both societies 
And uh, I agree with uh, Lean that people do not afraid nuclear war that like they used to be in uh, the beginning, beginning of 1980s. Uh, I was born in the late 70s and I remember uh, this fear coming from uh, mass media, from television, from uh, the press, uh, and uh, it has influenced everybody, including children in that time. And uh, we knew that uh, uh, we are in trouble and uh, uh, we, can, we can face uh, the military clash between two superpowers with usage of uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, it was, uh, and this threat was positive factor for uh, you know creating uh, the atmosphere uh, for the dialogue on both sides. On, on the one hand, it created fears, but on the other hand, it was uh, not uh, uh, not a bad, not such a bad thing, uh, because it made decision makers more focused on the practical result of preventing the direct conflict. And uh, the you now collapse of uh, the arms control system, which has started with uh, American decision to leave the IBM treaty, then it, uh, it uh, continued with uh, you know, the collapse of INF treaty and uh, with other elements, including uh, Open Skies Treaty. Um, I think it, uh, this uh, approach to the strategic stability and uh, uh, to uh, arms control in general, it has emerged from the um, uh, overestimating uh, uh, the real, uh, you know, uh, um, um, the level of uh, real threats, and uh, the level of threats is growing and uh, is growing quickly. And uh, sometimes decision makers they prefer to uh, live in more virtual world uh, than in uh, the world of uh, um, uh, direct military risks. I think military and technical people are much more uh, and much better understanding uh, real threats for both sides. You know, isn't it interesting uh, when, when you both talked about the uh, psychology uh, in terms of the general public, uh, the, the consensus seems to be neither Russians nor Americans are as afraid as they were three decades ago about the risks of a nuclear conflict between their two governments. And yet I would argue, um, I hope that this is obvious, that the level of sort of negative rhetoric and even alarmism about how scary the other side is, right? I talked about how Russian uh, popular media portrays the United States as very reckless, very dangerous, very uh, dysfunctional and unpredictable, both domestically and internationally. I think that's a fair characterization. Um, and then I think the US media, especially uh, post 2016, but even post 2014, uh, depicts the, the Russians and in particular Vladimir Putin as sort of a, a dark presence, you know, always, always waiting around a corner to sort of uh, cause some trouble, make some mischief. And yet, isn't it interesting that uh, with that level of negativity about the other, uh, neither is taken seriously enough to kind of rise to the level of an existential. And I almost wonder if that's either a giant logical fallacy, that it's just a huge mistake that that leap is not being made, or that there is some, there's some control in place. There is some kind of overarching adult logic that makes it less likely today that we would rise to a nuclear exchange versus 30 years ago. I wanna leave, if I can, I wanna leave that question percolating because we have a lot of audience questions and in particular about some of the regional circumstances that might give rise to US-Russia uh, confrontation and in fact to this ladder of escalation. Um, so I wanna to go to a question from uh, Zachary Pakin from the Cooperative Security Initiative uh, who asks, to what extent does improving the European security situation depend on the US fundamentally altering its posture of regional primacy. Given considerations about China, would such a shift be in the US interest? So I think Lynn, that's more a question for you to start with. Um, regional primacy in Europe. I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Um, look, I, th I think what's what concerns me in Europe is, well, there are a lot of things that concern me in Europe, but 
the most proximate, and this kind of goes back to what um, Matthew was uh, just talking about in terms of, I think what people are underestimating is the risk of conflict that could could start by an accident or miscalculation and a, conf and a conflict that would start in, in Europe probably conventionally, but you've even now, you know, we, we've got the dangerous military maneuvers, we've got, you know, forces in closer proximity, we've got, you know, in the Baltics and the Black Sea, um, where, where Russian forces and NATO, NATO forces um, are close to each other. And there've been a lot of, a lot of near misses um, that are concerning, and it would only take one to potentially, you know, lead to something more dangerous. I mean, that's a pure accident. Of course, there's also, you know, more broadly concerns about, about the Baltics, about, you know, the Russians you know, in what they consider their near abroad. Um, so that's, that's a dangerous area. And I don't think, although we um, do, you know, we are, of course, shifting our focus increasingly to the Asia Pacific. I mean, that's been a trend over the decades and it'll, it'll continue with China's rise. You know, Europe is still a really important region. Our allies are really important um, in maintaining security uh, in the European theater uh, and preventing conflict with Russia is um, essential as well as frankly deterring um, some of the dangerous um, activities Russia has been engaged in in and around Europe. So. Fyodor, thank you, thank you, and uh, Fyodor, if you're you're welcome to touch on this, but I want to add another question from uh, an audience member that I think is for you. Uh, this is from Dr. Martin uh, Katzmarski, uh, a lecturer in security studies uh, at the School of Social and Political Sciences in Glasgow. Um, he asks, to what extent arms control dialogue uh, with the United States and uh, signing bilateral agreements is essentially, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, important as a status uh, symbol for Russia, uh, and in particular for Russian leaders uh, who conduct uh, these types of negotiations? Is there an incentive to do these things uh, because it strengthens and confirms uh, Russia's status as somehow an equal to the United States, uh, a great power, et cetera? I see. Thank you, Matthew. I will uh, briefly start with European security and the uh, factors influencing on um, on it uh, in, in, in terms of arms control. And we'll continue with this uh, status question. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, uh, we need to think uh, about uh, new confidence building measures in Europe, uh, for Europe and for European security. We need to think about the new crisis management measures in case we will have uh, new uh, security crises uh, in Europe. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I think that uh, we could have, and we will have, we, 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 I'm afraid we will have it. Uh, because after the collapse of INF Treaty, uh, any decision uh, by the United States to deploy uh, ground-based intermediate missiles, uh, especially uh, intermediate nuclear missiles, uh, uh, in, in nuclear armed missiles in Europe will uh, of course uh, provoke very negative reaction uh, and uh, reciprocal measures uh, from Russian side. And uh, it will bring us easily to uh, the starting point of uh, um, uh, this uh, topic of intermediate nuclear forces, it will bring us to European missile crisis again, but uh, on the new technological level with engagement of uh, new instruments, uh, not only ground-based uh, um, uh, strategic, uh, uh, no, 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 not strategic, ground-based intermediate um, uh, missiles and cruise missiles, but also uh, ground-based cruise missiles, but also with other elements, new technological uh, elements and new, uh, you know, destabilizing factors, which will also have impact not only on the regional theater, but on uh, the strategic stability and arms control uh, in the sphere of strategic nuclear weapons. Um, concerning accident prevention, I absolutely agree. We need to think uh, how to renew the uh, mechanisms of accident prevention, because what we are having is uh, 1972 
Soviet-American uh, treaty uh, and uh, um, treaties with some other NATO members and between some other NATO members and Russia. But uh, um, what we have seen during operation on the, of the United States and Russia in Syria on the ground, uh, that on the ground we need to, uh, to, to, to build new forms of dialogue and um, um, uh, accident prevention measures. And we have seen uh, accident uh, uh, with Turkey with, uh, in 2000, uh, 2015. And uh, we have the high risks of new accidents in different regions, uh, not only with, between Russia and the United States, but between Russia and other members, uh, other of uh, the North, uh, North Atlantic Alliance. And um, concerning the status question, uh, I don't think it's an issue of status. Uh, you know, for a status of the global power in this field, uh, Russia can have uh, even uh, smaller nuclear potential. I think it's an uh, uh, issue of uh, uh, Russian security and understanding of uh, Russian military security because uh, we have uh, um, much smaller uh, capabilities in the conventional uh, uh, forces uh, comparing to North Atlantic Islands and uh, comparing to uh, other uh, major powers. And uh, Russia is relying on the strategic nuclear potential as uh, the as um, the instrument as on the instrument of uh, uh, prevention on of, of any um, military actions against Russian Federation and uh, also uh, together with uh, non-strategic nuclear potential it, it, it has become uh, a significant uh, instrument for um, you know prevention of uh, any military threats for Russia. Well, you know, Russian Federation is uh, having a stable and rather small military budget, and it is uh, more than 10 times smaller than American military budget. So Russian Federation is not interesting in, you know, uh, going on the same track with the United States in this field and having, uh, uh, you know, this reciprocity in uh, um, different types of, uh, mil of uh, 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 um, military um, uh, conventional and nuclear uh, capabilities. And uh, uh, Russia is uh, interested in uh, sufficient security for itself. Uh, but of course, uh, um, you know, strategic nuclear um, uh, capabilities have become, uh, they have become part of this uh, instrument of sufficient security. Uh, I want to I want to try and get as many more questions as I can in here in just over ten minutes. Um, so let me ask this one uh, quickly, if I can. And you you have both commented on China. Uh, I think you have both uh, correctly said that there is work to do uh, between the U.S. and Russia. First, uh, Lynn, you noted that there would be certainly work to do with U.S. allies in Asia. Uh, I think you said walk before we run. Uh, but a question from Jonathan Page asks, at least speculatively, uh, if there were a, a deal with China, and, and Fyodor, I understand you said that would have to include the UK and France, you know, either way, let's say if, if China were brought into an arms control framework, um, how would that look in, in broad strokes? Does, does it need to necessarily be kind of equal on all sides, or is there some other conceptual formulation that we could think about? Um, and if you guys can answer that very briefly, I'll, I'll be able to get in a couple. Okay, can I, can I make you mad and first go back to, I just can't let the INF discussion go without, without saying I, on the one hand, I, I share Fyodor's concern about a, you know, a, an arms race in that class of weapons. I can't let it go that, of course, the United States believes strongly that Russia deployed this class of missiles in violation of the treaty, which has led to its demise. And so the only way that I can see to avoid that arms race is to either some kind of a moratorium where we may agree to disagree on what the range of that missile is, but it's, it's moved out of the area that the moratorium would apply to, 
um, or else you start to loop that class of, of weapons into a strategic agreement that also includes intermediate range missiles. But anyway, pivoting, pivoting to China. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not sure I even know the, the answer to that. I mean, I, obviously a, an idea that's been around for a long time is to, to have the China, the UK and France um, agree to you know, cap their forces as the US and Russia um, get lower so that there's, you know, so at least they're not building their arsenals as we're coming down. Um, I, I, you know, I think it may have to do with the set of capabilities. I mean, it's, it's clear that missile defense is driving um, Chinese nuclear expansion um, in the region. So it's, it's, it's not, it's just, you know, we have asymmetrical uh, forces and interests uh, in the region. And so figuring out how to structure that kind of agreement remains to be seen. Of course, there's other P5 mechanisms too, like a fissile material cutoff, um, comprehensive test ban treaty. So there's other ways to, to get at um, reducing military or nuclear capacity of the other nuclear powers besides the US and Russia. Fyodor, you want to offer a quick comment on, on China? Yes, sure. Uh, I would like to start with moratorium uh, idea, which uh, Lin mentioned. Uh, uh, President Putin has uh, sent uh, letters to uh, uh, to the capitals of uh, NATO members and to some other countries, including also China, and suggested uh, a moratorium for deployment on uh, EFO for intermediate and short uh, range ground based uh, missiles, uh, and I think that it was only France, which uh, the only country which responded to this idea, and, posit, uh, and President Macron uh, supported it. Uh, so we do not have this moratorium yet, but uh, probably it can be the uh, can be developed uh, in case we will not have a treaty. Uh, comprehensive treaty between Russia uh, and the United States, and th this uh, is for, for intermediate and short-range missiles. And this question is highly interconnected with uh, issue of Chinese nuclear capabilities, because uh, right now is China, China is relying on intermediate uh, range uh, missiles, uh, also with uh, nuclear uh, warheads, and uh, they are developing uh, also um, hypersonic uh, uh, blocks for um, uh, this intermediate ground-based uh, uh, systems. And uh, Ch Chinese approach uh, to development of uh, uh, its nuclear forces is very dangerous, uh, is, ve is very different, I'm sorry, uh, is very different from uh, Russian and Soviet uh, approach because, uh, um, you know, Soviet, uh, Union and then Russian Federation, they were trying to keep uh, the balance with the United States in the sphere of strategic nuclear uh, for arsenal. But uh, China is uh, relying on uh, these types of uh, um, uh, you know, weapons uh, for regional dominance and for um, uh, um, you know, having all instruments of, for the prevention of uh, a military blockade, uh, especially on, on the sea, uh, in case of uh, conflict, direct conflict with the United States. And it's very different approach. Uh, but the United States are trying to uh, use uh, both approaches. On the one hand, they're trying to uh, have um, uh, strategic uh, nuclear balance with Russia and include China into this uh, mathematics. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the United States uh, using uh, the development of missile defense systems and using also uh, the instrument of uh, um, uh, intermediate uh, and short range systems are uh, trying to uh, catch these uh, this balances uh, with uh, China. Um, I think it's it's a strategy for the future, and uh, will it result a uh, uh, more secure environment uh, or not? Uh, we will see in the next five years. I think we have time for just one more question, and, and this is, uh, I apologize to those that I haven't gotten to. Um, this is a really suitable one, though. 
uh, Amy Wolf, uh, who in fact uh, covers nuclear weapons policy for the Congressional Research Service, the, the aforementioned Congressional Research Service, Lynn, uh, asks the following, I'll just read it. Uh, if the only acceptable outcome is a formal treaty so that the negotiations have a singular goal, isn't that a recipe for failure? Is there no value in considering arms control as a process to achieve some agreement on security concerns and to adopt cooperative measures to address those concerns, even if they're not codified in a legally binding treaty? I'd, I'd be interested not only in the kind of binary answer to that question, but what you think that process might look like. Um, who'd like to begin? Well, Go I can ahead. start. I mean, I think absolutely, and I think I said that in my introductory remarks, that when you look at the range of capabilities and concerns that there are, they're not all suited to legally binding agreements. Um, I think it's gonna be a mix. I, I don't, I'm not in the camp of, of, there are those who think that, you know, legally binding agreements, you know, are dead either because, you know, they don't work for our security or some people think they work for our security but will never get one ratified by the Senate again. I'm, I'm not in that camp. I think there is a role for, for legally binding agreements, um, especially, between US and Russia on our strategic forces, but other things like space, like cyber nuclear threats, um, even some of the things we're talking about in Europe, um, especially if you've got the, you know, the, the foundation of the legally binding verifiable agreement on, on uh, strategic systems, you, know, you can do things through um, unilateral restraint, through reciprocal measures, it might be more norms and rules of the road. Um, and, in, and, and, and accepting the fact that some things don't lend themselves, for instance, to, to verification in the way that we're used to in strategic systems. So I think it's a variety of, of tools to address some of these threats. And some of them are just gonna linger as problems, but we have to, we have to try to narrow the differences and reduce the risks um, of conflict and nuclear use. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, some of the terms of art from the last several decades, like you know, codes of conduct or uh, you know, presidential nuclear initiatives uh, or other kinds of unilateral uh, coordinated unilateral steps. Well, and also in you know, in missile defense, there's you know, decades going back to the George W. Bush administration of proposals on transparency and cooperative, you know, measures and activities, um, and so there's you know, there's lots of different tools that can enhance confidence. But of course, and, and I'll turn to you, Fyodor, for the final word, uh, attempting to do creative uh, and novel things or, or to apply um, uh, older ideas to newer technologies might require a different psychology of the relationship or different context of the relationship than the one we have right now, which gets to the, the problem we discussed earlier. Fyodor, uh, I'll let you have the final comment. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm on the same side with uh, Lean on legally binding uh, uh, treaties and uh, what you have mentioned about technology, the role of technology is very significant also because uh, usually uh, in the development of arms control process and uh, going from one treaty to another, we usually had two significant factors for uh, the uh, progress. First, uh, we had crises. And uh, they were stimulating uh, leaders to, to move to uh, have legally binding treaties. Uh, and second, we had technological developments, new technological developments. And each time new systems appeared, we have been driven by this factor. I mean, the United States and Soviet Union, the United States and Russia towards new treaties. And right now we have drones, we have high precision weapons, we have new uh, um, uh, systems like American LRCO uh, air-based uh, um, uh, missiles or uh, Russian uh, Kinjal systems and uh, uh, Burevesnik. Uh, and uh, these uh, systems are not you know, uh, uh, in the uh, tables of uh, uh, um, original and uh, uh, traditional understanding of uh, strategic uh, uh, nuclear and conventional system. And they will influence on the development of technological um, uh, in this uh, technological progress in this field. So we need another language for new technological reality, uh, taking into account also other spheres like cyber.
Well, uh, maybe it's just me, but I feel like what you've just said, Fyodor, that uh, technology has outpaced the frameworks, psychological, political, uh, diplomatic that we have created uh, to handle it, uh, I think is a metaphor for the state of our human condition uh, early in the 21st century. The technology and global challenges have far outpaced the capacities that we have to handle them across the board. Um, and so I think that that positions this problem of new start uh, of US Russian arms control of strategic stability, uh, and ultimately of non proliferation of the world's most dangerous weapons in the right context, which is this is uh, a truly global problem. And uh, I thank you both for helping us consider uh, several small pieces of it today. And I thank everyone for joining us and for your excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much.